So you're going to hear all these sophisticated talks coming up from Carly about genetics and then Mike about uh, treatment. So I get to do the basics because I know that there's a wide swath of people here, some of you new to the CMT field. And uh, so I wanted to make sure that we're all starting with a common foundation before we get into the, the fancy stuff. Um, I am excited to have you here at Stanford. We're very excited about the program that we're building. Um, this is where our adult clinic is currently, um, a beautiful uh, Art Deco building that was completely rehabbed a couple of years ago. And this is the new building they're building for us. So that this is a building that will be completely for uh, clinical neuroscience uh, and the first floor of which will emphasize uh, neuromuscular patients. And so that really is going to give us a, a place to do this. If you have time, you might want to walk around. You can see the rest of the campus here. And we, we collaborate with people in all of these buildings that um, are doing different things related to CMT uh, that from the biology department or the psychology department or the bioengineering or computer or genetics departments. Uh, it's, it's a very well, well integrated place. And there's a beautiful shopping center not far away. So if, if you have nothing else to do, you can always head over there. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great place. Uh, but it's only as good as the people that are in it. And uh, I introduced many members of our team that are here, but our team is much larger than that. So in the course of a couple of years, we've put together what I'm uh, really quite impressed by in terms of the number of neuromuscular neurologists who are here and the advanced, uh, uh, well-trained and seasoned uh, clinicians uh, on many fronts, as well as clinical research and basic science research team members that are allowing us to really, uh, really attack CMT uh, head on. Uh, for the rest of this talk, and I'll try to get us back on time, uh, Elizabeth. Um, we're all very cognizant of Elizabeth's watch. Uh, I, in the rest of the time, what I'm going to talk about is, as I said, basic issues. So make sure everybody understands what a neuropathy is. You've All too many of you gone through EMGs, and a lot of you think it's just our, our form of torturing you. And so I wanted you to understand why we do that, and actually why it's important, especially for CMT. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, the difficulties that CMT causes and then confront this issue that all too many people have heard as whether or not it's true that really nothing can be done for CMT anyway, so just go out and live your life because you can't do anything about it. Nothing really hits my nerves more than that. That just ticks the heck out of me. And so uh, the answer to that is no, it is not true, uh, but we'll come back to that. So what is a neuropathy for those of you who haven't thought about this before? So if you have in your mind that you want to move, move your limb, you've got to get some signal out from your brain to that muscle, to that limb. And how do you do that? Well, first you have to know where the limb is in space, and that comes through sensation, so that you have to have a sensory component. You have to have somebody out there telling your brain where your arm is and that comes through these sensory nerves that come in from the skin and go up through the spinal cord into the brain where you can sense them. And then you have to send a signal back down to the muscle uh, in the arm that allows that muscle to move. And so there's a, a second nerve that starts in the brain and goes all the way down. It, I know this is really fancy artwork. I, it it took, took me a long time <laughs> to do this. But at any rate, um, that's, that's the pattern. It's a very, very simple wiring diagram. Now, we all know that the brain is comprised of nerves, so is the spinal cord, uh, but when we talk about neuropathy, we're not talking about the nerves in the brain or the spinal cord. Just by convention, when we're talking about neuropathy, what we're talking about is the nerves after they leave the spinal cord. So that's just the way the terms are used. When we talk about neuropathy, we're talking about nerves on their way out from the spinal cord to the limb, to the skin, to the toes, to the fingers, wherever they're going. But that's the nerve, that's the neuropathy that, that is affected in CMT. 
so that these nerves come from the spine and when they leave the spine, from that point on, in almost all nerves, they travel together, the ones going to the muscle and the ones coming back from the skin. So the motor and sensory nerves travel together all the way out to where they're, they're headed. And for, for that reason, when you affect a nerve, if you just squish it, if you pinch it, if you have traumatic insult, if you have a stroke to a nerve, if you have anybody gets infected and the infection affects a nerve, it doesn't matter what it is, if you affect a nerve, you're gonna affect the sensation and you're gonna affect the strength because those wires are traveling together on their way out to their destination. They're very, very, very skinny uh, wires, basically just the long, thin ex extension of a single cell. So one cell lives in the spinal cord or right adjacent to the spinal cord and sends this long, skinny process out to the skin. So that's why these things are incredibly tough in one way, but very, very delicate in another. And consequently, they can be affected very easily. This just shows you the, the significance of one nerve better than anything I could say, so that here's a single nerve cell in the spinal cord that goes out to the muscle, and all of these white dots out here are muscle fibers that are innervated by that individual nerve cell. So one nerve cell sends its long, skinny process out to that muscle, and then it divides and might go to hundreds or thousands of muscle fibers once it's out there. So one nerve cell is incredibly powerful. One nerve cell controls all hundreds or thousands of muscle fibers in that muscle. And as a consequence, if you lose that one nerve cell, you lose control of all of those muscle fibers. Now fortunately, there's some redundancy in the system. So if you lose this nerve cell, if this nerve cell dies, the cell right next to it can actually spread out and take over the function of the one that's gone. So there's some, some overlap in the process. And so if you lose one of your nerve cells to your foot muscle, it's okay, you're gonna be covered because the neighboring one will be able to branch and take over the function. And you can do that for quite a bit. You could lose more than half of your nerve cells and the remaining half are more than capable of completely sprouting and taking over the function and keeping your muscle completely strong. They have to work twice as hard, but in working twice as hard, they can completely take over the function. So when you get to the point where muscle is actually getting permanently weak or atrophied, you have to have lost well over half and actually probably more like as much as 80% of the nerve cells before the muscle begins to atrophy and get, get uh, permanently weak. So there's redundancy in this system, which is good, uh, but these delicate little threads nonetheless carry a lot of impact. They're very important. So what do those delicate little threads do? They're very much like wires, so that there's a conducting part, much like the copper part of a wire, that runs through a nerve, and then it's surrounded by an insulation. So if you don't have the insulation in a wire that's running through the, through the walls in your house, the electricity will leak out and your house will burn up. So you have to have the wires insulated in your house, and very similarly, you have to have the nerves insulated as they travel down from the spinal cord to the skin or muscle. Without the insulation, the electricity in the nerve leaks out and it doesn't get where you want it to go. So here's a nerve. It looks very, very similar in a concept. There's a conducting part of the nerve and there's an insulating part of the nerve. But you remember, this is all biological. I mean, you know, it's really quite impressive. I mean, you know, the body knows how to do this, to construct this nerve in this way with the building blocks it has available to it so that everything can function. You get the long, skinny nerve going out, but you also can cover that with this insulation that's created by a different cell type. So looking at it more closely, you can see that it's very, very complex. There are a number of different proteins in here creating this insulation, but creating a little spot here where the, it's basically a booster station each step along the way that keeps the signal going and makes sure that it makes it all the way to the end. So this insulation 
is termed myelin, as many of you know. That's the insulating part of a nerve. And the conducting part, the part that actually carries the electricity all the way from the spinal cord down to the skin on your toe, is called the axon. And as I said, these things are just infinitely complex. They're really, really beautiful. I mean, they're phenomenal. I mean, you, you know, you have to think that, I mean, this is less than a, mi a millimeter. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's much, much smaller than a millimeter, a tenth of a millimeter, or even less than that. And, you know, there it is with all these constituent parts all lined up exactly the way they should be. It's just, it's really quite breathtaking to look at uh, under the microscope or electron microscope to see the structure. But the, the flip side of that is, if you don't maintain that structure, it doesn't work right. I mean, it's a Ferrari. This thing is really tuned just so tightly that if things get off a little bit, it's not going to work right. And so even though there are thousands upon thousands of proteins involved in constructing this, if you've got one missing, the whole apparatus can fall apart because it's so tightly integrated and jewel-like in its construction. So when we look at a nerve under the microscope, and this is looking at a, just one branch of one nerve, you can see these little donuts, and those are the individual axons in the, the pale part, the center part of that donut, and the myelin sheath around the outside. So this is a normal nerve, looking at the normal myelin, normal nerve in there, and each one of those little donuts has all of these elements to it, has all of the layers of myelin, individual proteins. Again, it's just, it's just in, incredibly well organized and structured. This is why a lot of us got out of the brain and into the peripheral nervous system to understand things, because we can get so precise about what's going on. The, the excitement that comes in the CMT field comes from the fact that we can understand this condition to a very, very, very precise level. And that in part comes from the fact that we can study it electrophysiologically, as I'm going to talk about, but also anatomically. We can take it out and look at it under the microscope, we can look at the biochemistry, and we can understand this in incredible detail. And there it is. Every one of those little donuts has all of those elements in it. So it's, it's an incredible process, but a little bit goes wrong and the whole thing doesn't work. So here's a nerve that doesn't work. And you can see it doesn't have the right type of myelin. The myelin here is, is very thin. There's not enough myelin. And the electricity is going to leak out of those axons and they're not going to carry the electricity down where you want the electricity to go. So it's, it's, it's very simple in one sense. Nerves are very simple. They just do a couple of things. They just carry a signal down the limb, but it's very complex in another way because of all the biological components that have to work together in order for that function to be achieved. All right, so this brings us to the functional side of this, or the physiological side. And that brings us to the dreaded topic of EMGs or nerve conduction studies. So we were giving a tour last night of our clinic and somebody wanted to be sure before they went back there that the EMG machines were turned off. And uh, I understand that. I mean, they're, they're not pleasant. But I want you to have some appreciation for it because I'll tell you, the, the, the fact that we were able to understand what's going on in your nerves as well as we could very early on in understanding CMT has led to the advances in the field. And it is through that, I mean, I'll, the people that study nerves in the brain and the spinal cord can't do that. And their, pa their patients might be happy that they don't have some comparable study where they have to shock the heck out of their spinal cord. But the downside of it is that we don't know as much about those disorders. We know a lot about CMT in part because we can do this. Okay, so just briefly, why do we do this? So if you have a nerve, I told you that all it does is send electric signals, and we can measure that, but they're all squiggly. If we just put on a wire and measured your nerves, it would be very uninterpretable because it's just firing off and sending signals willy-nilly. 
So what we do is we activate the nerve, and then we record it, and then we get a very synchronous response. So we get it to, we get it to respond in a way that we want it to. So it's only by stimulating it and recording it that we can see exactly what's going on. And we can do that and measure the velocity of how far it's gone and the time it's taken. And then we can do that in different types of nerves so that if we do that in a nerve that has normal insulation, we can see that it has a given speed. But there are also nerves, nerve fibers or axons in a given uh, nerve that don't have myelin. They normally don't have myelin. They're not all nerves need to have myelin. And what we can see is that those nerves are slower. So the myelin allows it to go fast, and the lack of myelin makes it slower. That's a normal response. But an abnormal response is if a nerve that is supposed to have myelin loses the myelin, because when it loses myelin, the signal slows down. With myelin, it's fast and compact, Without myelin, the signal slows down. And that gives us a measure then of how that nerve is working. And we do this in people. So some more of my illustrious artwork. But if we can study this in sensory nerves coming from your skin by activating the nerve out in the skin and measuring the signal as it goes past. And then we get a measure of how big that signal is. It tells us how many axons are in there giving us a signal. And we get a measure of the velocity. We know how far it's gone in what period of time, and that gives us a measure of speed. So we can measure both, if you want to think about it, the size of the signal, that tells us the number of axons, and the speed, that tells us the state of the myelin. We can do a similar thing in muscle, and many of you have experienced this, where we give you a an electric shock and watch your muscle twitch. So if we give a little bit, we can activate some of the nerves, but if we give more and more and more electricity, we can ultimately activate all of the nerves to that muscle and get a nice big response. And that's what we're looking for. We're activating all of the nerves going to that muscle. And by doing that, we can again get a measurement of speed. So we get a measurement of size of the signal which indirectly tells us how many axons there are going to that muscle. And we get a measure of speed by looking at stimulation at two different sites and then comparing the time it takes to go that distance. So it's very simple. It's a very simple concept. It'd be nice if we could do this without it causing any pain, but uh, that's a challenge. When we do it in someone who has a demyelinating process, the velocity is slower because it takes longer to go the same distance. And sometimes, not only is the velocity slower, but the amplitude is less. The size of the signal gets lower. So in this instance, we would say that the number of axons working is less, and the state of the myelin is poor because it's slow. So this just shows you from a real person with CMT, in this case one, that we could get that same kind of signal. So this is the kind of thing that we're measuring when we do these nerve conduction studies on you. We show how big their signal is, and then we measure the change over time. I have to thank Joanna Dearlove, who allowed me to use some of the slides that she put together for a recent talk to the residents. But what you can see, if we look at the conduction velocity here in the arm, these should be up about 50 meters per second. And here they are like under 20, very, very slow. And that tells us that the myelin is not working right, or it's not thick enough, it's not functioning correctly, it's not insulating that nerve right. The amplitudes here are also low, so there's some axonal loss probably as well. And this just shows you then from that person, if we look at all of their nerves, the important column is over here, the velocities, and all of these should be in the 50s or 40s, and uh, they're all in the teens and 20s. So that's way too slow, so we would say, okay, that person has a demyelinating type of neuropathy, and we'd go from there. 
So these nerve conduction studies that you put up with are really, really important to us because they allow us to categorize your neuropathy and they also provide a measure that we can use to follow the progression. Okay, so just a couple of words. I know I'm getting late already. Um, about, you know, the so what. Okay so, okay, so fine, you've got this low signal or you've got this slow signal. Why does that cause problems? An important point is that, you know, the slowing itself is probably not an issue for most patients. I mean, if you think about this, 50 meters per second, or 112 miles per hour, most of us don't think in terms of meters per second, but that's pretty fast, you know, so that it's traveling down a short distance of your arm at 112 uh, miles per hour. Obviously, there's not a lot of time it's gonna take, and even if it goes at a way slow speed of 20 meters per second, so this is way in the range of a demyelinating form of CMT, that's still 22 miles an hour, or it's, it takes to go from your spinal cord to your foot about a tenth of a second. So the speed in and of itself isn't so important for most activities that people go through, but it's incredibly important for us to understand what the underlying problem is. So it allows us to, to characterize it. This is what I meant by, you know, the people studying the spinal cord would love to have something like this, but they don't have anywhere near the type of ability that we do. So neurologists focus on this because it gives us a measure of how your nerves are functioning. And we oftentimes like to look at it repeatedly. We look at it the first time to diagnose you, and then we look at it subsequently so that we can see how your nerve is progressing. And furthermore, when we now get into the new era, when we start treatment, that'll give us some measure as to whether or not we're actually having an effective treatment. So we, it, you know, this is all of, of value to us. The problem comes for most people when the size of the signal gets less, when the, when the nerve fibers don't actually make it down to the muscle in one way or another, the signal doesn't get down there, then that's what causes the weakness or that's what causes the sensory problem. It's not the speed itself that ends up being all that significant. Okay, so just a couple of words about CMT. Basically, the longer the nerve is, there's several reasons why this is the case, the longer the nerve is, the more likely it is to have problems. And that's why people usually start having problems in their toes and then it goes to their balls of their feet and then up into their foot and up the ankle and then up the leg. So it's a very, very progressive process, a so-called length-dependent process. But because of that, we really, really, really focus on feet a lot, as, as do most people with CMT. It's a site that is so important, and it's important for a number of reasons. I mainly wanted to make a point here that because the longest nerves are affected, what that affects is these little muscles in the foot. Okay, so initially it starts out just affecting the muscles in the foot. And you might kind of think, well, gosh, how important is that? I mean, I never think about those muscles. I mean, I, you know, I, I like my muscles, you know, that I can see, but I can't really see the muscles in my foot that much. But it turns out they're incredibly important because they keep your toes lined up correctly. They keep everything oriented correctly when the big strong muscles of your calf and leg start working, if those toes and, and uh, the rest of your foot isn't aligned correctly, they're gonna pull it out of shape. So that it's because you've lost the intrinsic foot muscle, musculature, because the, that's the longest nerve, that now when the calf muscles start trying to take over the function and keep you from tripping over your toes or allow you to push off when you're walking, that you start distorting the foot. This, the foot gets distorted and you end up with this pes cavus formation or hammer toes because you have the wrong nerves, wrong muscles acting to compensate for the loss of the muscles in the foot. And it's an important concept because it means that when we see people before they've developed severe deformities of the foot, it gives us something to work for. If we can support the foot, maybe we can avoid some of the consequences uh, of an unsupported foot. So, same thing uh, uh, with regard to 
uh, loss of sensation, but I don't have time to cover everything, so I'm going to kind of skirt past that. The loss of function in your foot and the, and the uh, secondary consequences uh, from that are significant. So that, you know, not only might you increase the risk of falling and breaking a leg or twisting an ankle that causes its own problems, but just landing on the foot incorrectly in various ways because of the deformity and because of how your muscles allow your foot to land can cause all kinds of other consequences affecting your ankle joints, your knees, your hips, your back, everything is connected and if your feet aren't landing correctly it has a significant consequence. So that pain ends up being a, a significant issue in a lot of people with CMT not so much directly due to the neuropathy, although that does happen too, but oftentimes because of the effects on uh, the, the joints uh, that are damaged uh, as a consequence of that uh, intrinsic foot muscle weakness or uh, weakness at other sites. Another point that we end up stressing is the fatigue issue because if you, as I already told you, that if you lose 50% of your nerve fibers to one muscle, the remaining 50% can take over the function and you have normal strength. But they do that by working twice as hard. So yes, they are going to all the muscle fibers, you are maintaining activity of all those muscles, but it's at a cost, and the cost is uh, excess work. And so uh, fatigue ends up being a significant part of this, and I think we have to uh, think about that when we're talking with people about their activity level and what's going to work for them and how we can come up with the ways to assist them so that they can get through their day most effectively. So is it true that nothing can be done for CMT? And I hope you can see that now that's just a bunch of malarkey. And, and unfortunately, it's spread too widely, but we're trying to do everything we can to combat that because I think there's an awful lot we can do. We can assist people uh, so that their joints stay healthy. We can assist people so that they're not exhausting themselves, that they're not exercising inappropriately. Exercise is an incredibly important part of CMT but you need to know how to exercise. We want you to stretch, we want you to maintain flexibility and balance, we want you to maintain endurance, and we want you to strengthen the muscles that you can strengthen. But some muscles are too atrophic, and if you start to really whip those muscles into shape, you're actually gonna cause more damage than you are benefit. And so it's, you have to be sensible about this, and a lot of that is just learning about your own body. You have to, I mean, everybody's an individual, and so it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of a solution, but it is something that we definitely want to work with you on to make sure uh, you stay as active and functional as possible. The other thing is that having one nerve problem kind of decreases the threshold for your having another nerve problem, so that if you have a neuropathy, you probably can injure your nerves in another way. So one of the things that we do in clinic, for instance, is to make sure that you're not doing anything that's compounding your problem by pressing on a nerve or by irritating nerves in a different way. Uh, certainly we try to avoid uh, any kind of toxic uh, substances that might be damaging nerves. Uh, unfortunately, if you can't exercise well, you tend to get overweight. If you get overweight, you have an increased risk of getting diabetes. If you get diabetes, you're more likely to damage your nerves. You can see the way this all kind of adds up. So there's a lot that can be done uh, to uh, help people with CMT stay active and help, uh, healthy and functional. It's important to us that we do everything we can now, not only to help you with your life now, but so that when we come to doing our treatment trials in the near future, we're comparing people that are all doing as well as possible. If we're, if we're looking at people, some of whom are taking care of themselves and some of whom are not taking care of themselves, these drugs, these new treatments aren't magic wands. They don't just come out and pop you on the head and your CMT is gone. They will affect the CMT, but we need to make sure that you're doing everything you can already to control it. And so that's our, what our approach is in clinic. That's why we have as many uh, practitioners there as we do uh, to address this from all fronts. 
So we are eager to, to move to the new era of treatment. We're excited about it. We have, I mean, I could give you a talk about that as well. You know, the things that we think are coming down the pike that are gonna be really instrumental in combating CMT. But uh, we need to do that with an infrastructure of, of providing excellent care to start with. So CMT alters nerve function through either demyelination or axonal loss. EMGs are important. I really appreciate your allowing us to do them so that we can continue to understand the neuropathy as well as we do. Length-dependent motor problems leads to all kinds of issues, including pain, loss of sensation, weakness, and uh, fatigue. And there's a lot that we can do to help people live more active, full lives today, and that's going to allow us to work together with you so that we can combat this more fully in the future with uh, the upcoming treatments. So that's my summary of the basics. And oh. Thank you, Dr. Day, for such a wonderful presentation.